Okay. Hello, everyone. It's so good to see you all again. And we are now on the, I believe, the ninth time that I've done one of these uh, free Zooms. And uh, today I was, I wouldn't be it because I had a lot of clients and different things to do. And I'm like, no, I feel like I really want to do it today because a lot of things happened during the week and I'd like to share a lot of what went on. And it's helping me to clarify what I don't clarify to people. And I, I think I take things for granted. Like if I told someone something, they would just get it. And then I realized there's many, many layers. And this is all new information for a lot of people. So it's hard to grab something when you're starting at the very beginning and try to incorporate this into your training and trying to think about how it works and all those good things. So tonight, what I wanted to do, uh, because this came up during the week is one of the important things. Last week, I talked about relational training versus uh, dominance training. And um, I just want to expand a little bit on this because I think the person that I ran into this week didn't quite understand what that meant in terms of training the horse. And so um, she had two young horses and I was working with one. That horse is quite bold and he enjoys contact with people. He thrives on being in contact and I've been working on training him to like, here's your respectful place. You stay that far away from me, and then I will approach you and um, initiate a contact with you because he seemed to get too revved up if we let him come to approach us. So I um, insisted that he stay a certain distance away and that he behave himself there, and then I would approach him. And I used some different techniques with with that and with him it was like his biggest thing was he wants to be around us so to be told to go away was like devastating to him because you could see like I, I don't want to go I want to be with you so we can use that with him saying if you want to be next to us here's the acceptable behavior you stand still and you're a nice boy you don't try to jump on us you don't try to bite us you and all of that and um, if you don't follow those rules, then we'll ask you to go away. And it wasn't that I asked him to go away in a mean way. I didn't throw a rope at him. I didn't do anything other than make a noise. And I would say, <clears throat> and it would make him stop and he would go away. And so for this horse, all I needed to do was that. And I never had to touch him to make him go, oh, I'm exceeding my boundaries, I better back up. And so that became my cue if he's starting to ramp up in his uh, excitement level or anything like that, all I'd have to do is make that little noise and then he would excuse himself and go away. And sometimes he had a little temper tantrum on the outside and then he would come back in and when he would come back in, he'd be very gentle and he'd stop. I'd say, okay, stop there and he would stop. And then I would approach him and scratch his neck or whatever to praise him for listening and being respectful. So this relational work with him then, I'm assessing him at every moment of the time I'm working with him. What does this horse want? What does this horse need? And how can I capitalize on those parts of his pers personality so that I can make his training and learning easy on both of us? That I don't have to be constantly correcting him for something. And he was, of course, you know, he's a little stud cold and he's not very old. And so, you know, he's wanting to explore the world through his mouth. And so he's doing a lot of mouthing. And I would make that noise and I would send him away. And that was like, oh my God, but I want to be by you. And so it, it didn't take very long. It only took a couple sessions before he could come up and just be very quiet and just stand there and be respectful. And uh, um, then at that point, it's like, I'm gonna teach him to lead. And it's, it's a really simple process. And the whole time that I'm teaching him to lead, I'm thinking about where is his excitement level? Is he in a frame of mind to learn? And this is the key to starting a young horse is you, 
assess how that horse handles the whatever you're giving him does he think about it is he overreactive and you're having to assess all these different things that are going on with the horse and trying to teach him things when he's in a calm state of mind because if you can get them to learn when they're in a calm state of mind they're going to retain that information if you try to teach them when they're in an excited state when they're in fight or flight or like him if he got ramped up he would just ramp up and then get so excited like a little cold i don't blame him you know it's like no you go away and do that out there because you know i needed to give him an outlet also so that he could express like i'm getting really anxious and i want to bite you but then i then i can't bite you so oh i can just go away and just kind of go walk around and walk it off and then he would come back over so he's learning how to self-regulate his emotions when he gets upset he instead of like trying to jump on top of us or bite us or or kick or do anything he goes oh wow those aren't working so i better just go over here and then i'll get myself together um i'm i'm making assumptions that's what he's thinking but if you were watching him you would see that he was thinking very carefully because i never got mad at him i just made the noise it's like no no we're not doing that and then he would go away then he'd come back and be very nice and I understood that because he was a young horse, he can't be expected to be good all the time or for long periods of time. So I would give him a little bit of time and then I would walk away and do something else. I'd come back and show him a little more, always thinking about what does he need? What does he want? And when we started to lead, I just started with some very simple things one day of just showing him here's some pressure and if you move your feet over here i was helping him just move his feet and it's like i bet you tomorrow he's going to lead and the person goes well how could you go from just moving his front feet over from a little pressure on the lead rope to he's going to lead tomorrow it's like because because i've started him in this frame of mind where he's understanding what this means so no, he knows this one part of leading is I'm going to put a little pressure on the rope and you're going to follow that. And it was, and a couple of times he wanted to run away or have a little temper and it's like, you know, that's fine. That's learning. And I did not change my emotional. I didn't do anything different. I just brought him back in and said, here's how we learn in the quiet space. So the next time I went over, started just moving his feet wow it was really soft like he could just move his front end all over he could figure out how to do that and then you start and you just go into having circle and then all of a sudden he's leading and it's very soft he's not running over the top of me when i stop he stops and it's all this thing of building on that okay this is what's okay when you're a good citizen when you do what you want what, what I'm asking in a soft way, I'm gonna match this with softness in my body and it's gonna be fun. And there's been very little resistance. Like you can lead this on a soft rope. He just will go wherever you want. And the owner was a little bit shocked because she's like, how does he do that? Is that a fluke? And I said, no, it's not a fluke. This is how it should start. We don't, do leading as one entire thing. It's little pieces, little pieces of the leading. And the first part of that was getting his feet to move and him knowing I could move my feet. And then it was like, you could move your feet a step or two and then stop. And then all of a sudden he put it to get it on his own. And, and this whole process, it wasn't like I went in there and, okay, I've got 10 minutes to work and we better work every single one of those 10 minutes. It was like, we got 10 minutes to work. I'm going to work with him one minute and there's going to be a whole lot of not doing anything, kind of standing around, being quiet, being nice. And so this is also that important piece that some people forget about when starting a horse is that it's not the doing part that is important. It is, 
but it's more important to have greater time of not doing and time enough for them to think about things and understand, stay quiet. So those are the main things that I want from the young horses to know there's always going to be a rest that he may go up to a threshold of I'm starting to get nervous. I back it off because I'm watching and I'm aware. I back it off and let him digest that and then go back and ask again. And it's usually if I've waited enough time, then the next time I ask, it's not a big deal. So some of the problems I'm seeing with horses uh, with either trauma issues or behavioral things is they were trained in a way that they didn't get enough time to think. And if you're starting a horse or restarting a horse, just know that if you get to the point where here's the time I'm gonna pause, pause longer than that. Okay, get in trouble if you pause. You get in trouble if you go too fast too soon. Okay, so um, with him about relational training, what I'm trying to do in this initial work with this young horse is that he's, I want him to understand that I am that place of safety. I'm that person or thing that will understand what he's experiencing and let him express it or let him stop and process it. And that I'm a place of safety and comfort. And if he's in trouble, I'm the person he's gonna go to, to get him out of trouble. Because there was one time when I was leading him and he kind of took off and he ran around and he had the rope going around backward behind him. And I thought, oh, he's, he's never had that rope chase him. What's he gonna do? Okay, and then it's, he, he went around a couple of times and then he stopped and then I approached him and everything was quiet. And I, I told him that's the perfect training thing because now he could see me as the one that would get him out of trouble when he got into some trouble and that I made that rope following him go away and he was fine and nothing happened. And I was quite, Please, because he's a horse that comes from a line of very, you might call them hot horses or, you know, more horses tend to be a little more anxious than other horses, especially in situations like that. And it's like, it was great that, okay, if I just stop, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. If I get in trouble and I stop, it'll be okay. And isn't that what we want instead of a horse bolting? It feels like it has run out of options and it bolts on us. And how many people tell me my horse bolts when it gets afraid? It bolts when it, you know, and I'm thinking, gosh, darn, that's not a good option. I mean, if I'm going to choose an option when the horse gets afraid, I'd rather him stand still and wait for me. And this is when you build this in is if you have the opportunity to build it in when they're younger then you never have to deal with that issue later on. And of all the horses that I had in my lifetime, and I had Morgan horses, which tend to be a little, you know, they're pretty hot. They're not really, but they can get revved up pretty good by people that don't understand that personality type. And um, I think about, wow, I had some really, if I thought about it, super hot horses, super hot. Not a one of them ever bolted. And I, I didn't think about it until really when I really started thinking training is like, why didn't they, why did they just, you know, they might um, get an agitator or whatever, but they did not run off with me. And it's because of this attention to providing this safety place for them and that I was a safety, not some other place outside where they could run to. So as far as this relational training, and I, I realized that I didn't explain it fully to this person I was working with either because um, she had another young horse and she's going, well, well, we can't make that noise you do with 
with the young colt and she started telling me all the things that um we weren't going to do with her other horse and i thought well why would you you know it's like if this is relational training then of course i'm not going to do the same thing with another horse as i did with him every technique i used with him is specific to him it was what he needed at the moment at this point in time and this other horse is a completely different personality. So she's going to have completely different motivations, things that motivate her to do something and completely different. She's not as bold. She, and so there, I don't have to do some of that. Like the noise was to startle him and get his attention so that he would stop it at something he was um, doing and stop the, him from ramping up. Well, with her, the lady goes, well, I used that with her and she ran off and she was like all intimidated. Well, it's like, that's because that was not appropriate for that horse because of her personality. And to use that was for her like, like 5,000 times worse. You know, it's like, it was devastating for her to ha hear that noise and like be scared and all that. And so with her, I'm going to take a completely different approach to how I start her and how I act with her and how do I find her motivation place. With him, with her, she wants to be away from people. With him, he wanted to be with people. So that has to require a completely different outlook on how you're gonna start that horse and what you're gonna do with them. And you will not use the same techniques with her as you would with this other one. And so I think that as we get into relational training, you'll see how if you go down that route that there, when I tell you on the website or on my Facebook page that uh, please don't put in training techniques um, that you're offering to other people based on what you hear this person has this trouble with their horse, please don't add your training techniques because we don't have an option using relational training to know what would work with that horse. And to grab something from a, a blanket way that people deal with, let's say biting or trailer loading or whatever, to grab just a, a generic solution that's out there, we would be remiss and we would actually miss what we really might need to do with that particular horse. So is that's why I hesitate to make training videos and why I've hesitated to give people certain training techniques because then they just use those and think, well, she uses training techniques. So that should apply to all horses that I come across. Absolutely not. And that's where we have to get out of the mindset of there is only one training technique or a few that work for something. Inside your toolbox that you'll start to develop here, and I, I will have videos where I show different types of horses and what I would do differently with each one, you're going to start to see that you can have a whole, whole big bunch of behavioral thing that you might want to do or one training thing you might want to do. And when you get to that level of sophistication, you really start to become a good horseman because you realize, yeah, that didn't work on that horse why why didn't it work oh I forgot to pay attention to that personality thing that he has and I should have been doing this different I should have been maybe trying this to do different and like I said I haven't haven't done a lot of of training videos yet because I think also in this relational training the most important piece that I'd like to see Betty get is this connection the connection and have the connection become very strong and stable because that the training is so much easier and you find you don't even need to have certain techniques. You might need to know about them, but you don't have to apply them in the same degree of force if you might for lack of a better word. Um, so I kind of give this example today that I went out to work with a horse and um, it was interesting because he didn't want to connect initially. And so we had to find that thing that that way to motivate him to lead. And um, 
what was interesting about this horse was that uh, when you first asked him to lead, he would match, match the pressure on the lead rope with equal resistance. And so I had to go, okay, so he's used to, in his neural connections and the way his brain has been con, um, programmed is that the first initial reaction to any pressure is to resist it, okay? And I said, we're, we're gonna work on getting rid of that initial resistance, but it's so ingrained in his neural connections that that's his first response. So he's gonna do that every time until we show him that that's no longer necessary and we have to reprogram that and, and do consistently do something different here until that resistance piece goes away. But in the meantime, we're not going to meet resistance with more resistance on our end. So I was like, okay, so we'll just put a little pressure on the rope, but then we're gonna change ourselves and then become like something fun to follow. And, and so he started getting that and then he moved off. And, and when um, the owner got to a place where, okay, don't ask a question, are you going to come with me on that? You're just gonna go forward and start going and say, wouldn't it be great to come with me? And so he was starting to get that. And then by the time we had gotten from, he was walking just like, it, there was like this instant change in his um, demeanor. Like before he was leading behind and he was kind of lagging and it was like, uh, and so she was working on changing her level of like, yeah, this is fun and this is gonna be great. We're gonna go do this. And then all of a sudden he's up and he just changed his demeanor. And then he was up right beside her shoulder walking, his ears went forward and he was like, you could see a whole change in his body as he began to walk with her in a different way because she changed her. And um, she worked a little bit on, on the resistance and, and not matching it when he was just like going everywhere. And then she goes, let's, I, I wanna uh, see how he does with the trailer because that had been kind of a, a little bit of a sticky point for him. And so, um, she was in the trailer and she asked him to come in and he did his usual stop. I'm not gonna go forward. And when I watched this stop and him not wanting to go forward, I could see that what was really happening with him is in this place of where he would do resistance, he actually checked out. Like in his whole eyes and everything, he, it was just like he was gone somewhere else. And so I said, okay, let's do something to get him out of that state. And so I, I think she just changed a little bit, like emotion harder, a little bit um, more fun in herself. And then I was in there and I asked her, I was like, is this about a little bit about, you have a hesitancy in you about him getting in the trailer down deep, like you replay a little bit of what happened in the past that wasn't so good. And she said, yeah. I said, okay, so why don't you let me do this first, I'll put him in the trailer first. And I just got in and he, I just got like lightness and magic is like, he just gone in. And I said, the only difference is I don't have that history with him. I don't have anything going on in my mind that would make me believe he wouldn't get in the. And so after she saw that, then the next time she tried, he just walked right in. Okay, so it's really just about awareness. Where are we stopping that horse in our own mind and our own belief system about, well, they, maybe they can't do this. Um, so he was, he got in, he was quiet again. This is where I used the pause. When he came in the trailer, I was in a quiet place and I, I just stayed in that space and he got so that he was just in there and just really relaxed, he didn't move or anything. And then he backed out really quiet. And then we were sitting on the edge of the trailer talking a little bit about um, his motivation and what motivates him. And, and we were, um, I don't know what else we were doing, but we're just sitting on the edge of the trailer and he's kind of facing us. And he was just hanging out with us then by that time. And then it was like, he started moving forward. And I said to her, I think he wants to show us how he gets in the trailer. I mean, it's just a weird thought that came in my mind. And so I'm like, 
why don't we see? And, and sure enough, it was, it was interesting because then she let him go and he just got himself in the trailer on his own and stood there. It was like the softest thing. And she's like, oh my God. And I'm like, I'm around the back of the trailer crying my eyes out because I mean, get, like I say, and it's a, it's a good tear day. Oh, <laughs> I can't believe that happened. Um, but it was all this lack of like need for him to do it. And, and, and when we were sitting there talking and being relaxed, and it was so funny because I could just see him going, I can do it. I could do it. I can do it without you. And it was so much fun to watch him just change. And, and his whole demeanor after that, it's like we listen to him and we know that he had something to show us. And then the rest of the time, like at the beginning of the session, he was walking really stiffly. And after we were done, it was like he was walking with purpose. He was walking without that stiffness in his body. I was, I was pretty amazed because at the first of the session, when she went out to get, she went to lead him, it was almost like he couldn't move his shoulders and he was so stiff. And I thought at the time, I said, I don't think that his stiffness is necessarily physical. I think it's more in his mind. And I'm not sure. I mean, she'd been working on his feet and some different things. And she said, no, he's not. The vets looked at nothing they can figure out is, is physical causing all of this. And I thought, what if it is just mental, emotional? And it was interesting after we had this session and he worked in this calm space and we gave him lots of time that he, that stiffness was gone. And it, even when we let him go afterwards and he went back down in the field, walking with the other horses, he was walking out and he was not, his body looked more fluid. And it's like, we did not do anything body work wise on this horse. So what if that was just his mental remembrance of I need and what if I'm resistant and I can't move and then they don't make me do it. And you know, who knows what that might have been. But um, I just find this work when we start attention to the horse's needs and what's going on that we begin to see things disappear that used to be a problem. And so that was that was my um, bits on relational training today, and um, I I think this conversation will I'm sure continue on as I get more examples that I can share with you. Um, you know, over time I've had so many and these ones that I come to mind, and so that I can share them after I've worked with a horse, so they're fresh in my mind, and I can. Uh, really share because before I kind of blew them off because I wasn't really doing, you know, educational work or anything like that. So it wasn't necessary for me to necessarily write them down or remember them. But now I'm going to try to make a point of sharing these examples with you guys so that um, just like on the site, when I see people going, oh, look what happened with me. Now we're understanding that these things can happen. And as we do understand they can happen, we can happen more often, they can happen more often. So I think this is great. Um, one of the things that I had on my uh, website, because we've gotten a whole lot of new people lately and I, I think a lot of them have come on and they're, they're, they're getting up to speed, so to speak, with what we're doing. But um, there are questions that people are asking and they're still in this place of, is this woo-woo? They call it woo-woo. And, um, and they question about, can it work at a distance? And what's amazing, I don't know the answer to why it works at a distance. I, I actually think sometimes it works better. I just have several um, clients this week and we've done them with the PIVO tracker camera doing a lesson and um, I get to see, in that case, I get to see what's happening in real time with the horse as we work together. And I'm pretty astounded, like, wow, I thought I always had to be there and I don't. It's like, what's happening is is pretty remarkable. It's, it's no different than if I were in person there. I may not be able to see at times some of the really subtle differences that are happening with the horse, but the client is seeing it. I'm, 
if their back is to the horse or they've got their eyes closed, if we're doing something, I can still be seeing the horse and monitoring and, and it's just fantastic. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily, because sometimes I'll say, okay, let me do this with the horse and then I'll and then see the horse release or do so. Can that be happening from a distance? It's like, I'm not sure, but it, I don't think there's any, any kind of restrictions on energy and intention. Like they, they move through just like our cell phones, like that connection I have with the cell phone with the person. Um, I think it's just as rapid as that. If not even, sometimes I think it's faster because I'll just start thinking something and it's already happening on the other end. So I don't have the answer for that, but I do know from anecdotal information that it's happening and for me at this point in time that really is what matters because I'm, I'm looking at results not about why why does it happen I uh, this is one of those times when I talk about it's we just have to have faith that it works and I have faith that it works and the more faith I have it seems like it's working even more strongly than it ever has before and um, again if people are on here that haven't been and they've heard me um, and my feelings about the word woo woo, because I, I, I appreciate that um, people are exploring these different areas, but I also don't want it uh, again to be looked at as less than another technique or that it's outside of scientific possibility because I spent so much time being put down because I was considered woo-woo or um, uh, abnormal. <laughs> so <laughs> I guess is the best word, you know, and, and ostracized and, and uh, pushed out of mainstream um, and, and lacking credibility because people put it in this, this woo-woo place and it's, it's not, it's science. And that's why I've worked so hard to find scientific explanations for what's going on. And I, I really want to stay in that realm of, you know what, if we have this group of now it's over 1100 people in our group, and most of them have tried this and many of them live in other countries and they have a whole lot of um, different experiences, different types of horses. Um, and if they're getting the results doing the same things, I don't think that's woo woo. Because I don't, if you think of that, that we think people who have some kind of magical abilities, only that person has the magical abilities, not everybody. I'm seeing everybody be able to do this with just giving them some really simple things to do. And humming up and like, doing it and having really good results. And um, so I, I just wanted to, again, touch on that with the number of new people coming in so that they know exactly where I'm coming from, that I'm not necessarily going to say this is woo woo because I want us to spread this work around the world and for it to gain credibility in the place that it needs to because the more, out of that kind of um, supernatural place, although it is how I look at it, it's not outside of everybody's abilities and we're seeing that. So I um, just wanted to touch on that. Uh, and kind of on that same note, I, I wanted to talk again because I think about, when people are doing work and, and how do we access this intuition that what I use when I'm training these is really about intuition. What do I feel at that moment that that horse needs? So it's really my intuition that I've got to access. And what is intuition? It's a feel, it's a knowing, it's, it's how things like, in the moment, what do you feel? Okay, and we got into this a little bit last time about how do you feel? How, 
because that's where horses are working in that feeling mode. And this part of the connection that I talk about is us becoming more feeling creatures than thinking creatures. Okay. And so I've, I talk about, um, you know, if I get stuck with something, I access the internet of intuition. And I kind of, I don't know if anybody's used that term before, but somebody went and Googled it and they said, oh, there's no such thing. And it's like, well, that's because it's, it's just made up thing. But it's always when we get in trouble to access the internet of intuition. And if you think of like artificial intelligence is what everybody goes to, you know, we, we want to Google something, we want to use a, a tool of some kind of um, technology to tell us what is going on. And so we have this artificial intelligence to tell us what's happening. Okay, and that's AI. And, you know, that's good to a point. But you notice that I don't really use anything like that, because I think it's so important for us in the training and riding of our horses that we're accessing our own intelligence and accessing our own intuition, not relying on something outside of us to tell us where we are and what we're thinking. And so I, I like the internet of intuition because I call it the I, I, I intelligence, me intelligence, I, I, not AI. So uh, be asking people that I work with, what are you feeling? What do you think? What do you feel now? And a lot of them say, I don't, I don't know the answer. I don't know anything. It's like, yeah, you do. But when you first start working with your intuition, it's quiet and it's so imperceptible because you've quieted it for so long, you haven't paid attention. And so it's, it doesn't have a loud voice. And so when you're quiet and when you take those pauses and a lot of those pauses that I talked about with the young horse that I was training, that's so I can access my I, I, my internet of intuition, my internal intelligence, my I intelligence. And if you spend enough time in that quiet place, you'll start to get the messages and you'll start to feel and you'll start to know. And so I just want to give you that permission to go ahead and, and just play with it. It's like today I play with somebody, it's like, can you feel, um, we just did some muscle testing with standing. It's like, well, I don't, I don't feel anything, but she was expecting, I, I just have someone stand and then we ask a question, my name is so-and-so and you'll either go forward or backwards or in her case, she felt lighter or heavier. Yes or no, yes was lighter and no was heavier. And so that was the way she felt her intuition come. And then once she realized to put her attention on that, she could ask other questions and get the answer right away. But it was just because she hadn't noticed that or taken the time. But once she did, it was right there. And so I think it's really fun to, we're just all playing here and finding out feel in the world, how we each experience this world. So I think that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about. We have about 20 minutes maybe for some questions. So if anybody is interested and wants to do that, um, I am more than happy to. And what we have down here at, let's see, is it the reactions part? I think you hit on there and there's a little hand there. You can raise your hand and it'll come up. Um, if, if I'm not right, somebody can put that. Go to the bottom of the screen under reactions and raise your hand. Yes. Okay, Leslie got it. Okay, so um, I'm happy to answer anything if anyone has anything here tonight. And we can go from there. Okay. And if not, and I see Terry on here. And Terry Anderson, if you're... Um, still around after this, I'll try to call you after this, because <laughs> I need to speak to you before about the clinic coming up. So um, that's one thing here. Okay. She did. I just talked too much. I don't see anybody's hand. Gail Simmons has a question. Okay. Let's see. Gail. Hello. Yeah, I'm right here. 
There you are. So um, I've got a, I've just got two things. One, the woo woo business, you know, how um, Warwick uses woo woo all the time. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Did, did, did you know that how Warwick okay, so uses the Warwick, Warwick uses you all the time? Yeah, I, I was thinking yeah. that I thought about that too. Um, you know, I do animal communication, a lot of people don't hear, but just on the energy level, woo woo to me when someone uses that, I think they're saying this is fantastic, but I don't understand it yet. You know what I mean? I don't feel like they think I'm a witch or I'm doing magic mm -hmm. or puffy poofy stuff or woo woo in the in the old fashioned sense of the word I think they say wow wow that's cool yeah. I don't get it yet it seems like magic and then there are other people like you were saying who are really insulting and they think you're weird yeah that. but what I really wanted to ask you was to go back to that that story about the woman you just mentioned where you gave her the pause and you started to bring in intention can you mm -hmm. explain a little further um, about that intent? What what happened then with the intention? Because when when I'm talk doing energy work, intention is the most important thing at the ex at the expense of everything else. So all of the chatter in your head goes away. You get in that quiet space. You go in with intention, which comes from the questions from the person who wants me to talk to their horse. So I was I'm really curious to hear the details about that okay. moment when you asked her to pause you're together and she has intention if you can okay um you broke up a little bit but i think i'll try my best here to answer um so the intention is like you say the most important thing gail at least for me okay. but here's where it's difficult sometimes and what we worked on with her is like okay, so you have an intention, you want to get in the trailer. And what is attached to that intention? If for some horses, if there's any little bit of attached to that intention, I need you to get in, I really want you to get in. And sometimes when I stand there, I can add a bit of need and it blocks the intention and so if I can like they might not even it comes from a sub subconscious place sometimes and I can feel it in the energy field um, so I can point it out and when I point it out to them they go oh my god yes I did have like I really really want it or but I thought it was soft it's like no our intentions have to go out in this kind of way like it's okay if it doesn't happen. It's okay if it does. It's great if it does. And even with her horse following her, the intention was strong to like, like I really, really want this. And if the intention, like he, it would shut him down. And if I just walked off and said, oh, I'm just going over here and I'm going to do this. It's kind of fun. It's like he was right there. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's such a minute thing when you start looking at really underlying desire for this intention, what lies under that intention. And this takes time to practice to get to a point where it's okay. It's okay if it happens. It's okay if it doesn't. And I can tell you this came from when I worked in sports psychology and went into that end of it and and I would see athletes and they're like really high end athletes and they would get, but you don't understand, I need to win. <laughs> and they never would. It's like, why is that? What happens when you need something that badly and then it can't happen, even though you're more than capable of doing it, but it blocks it. And it, I don't know what level it blocks the energy, but I've seen it happen so many times. And that's why I'm very, when that's why I think it's great when you have somebody, even like if I had somebody, I'm like, I'm trying to do this. And they go, well, yeah, you're trying too hard. What? But wait, we're, you know, it's one of those weird places we get into where, oh my God, like, okay, the more harder I try, the less I get. 
That doesn't make any sense. Especially when I get these A-type people like, yeah, but it works in the business world. It's like, yeah, but it doesn't work here. <laughs> you know, it's like, wow, okay. Um, but yeah, the, the intention and what I was telling her during the whole time is what I'm checking in. Again, I get back to where it is, what am I feeling? Okay, so I'll check in and go, okay, I put out an intention. Then I'll check in back in myself because I'll find that little needy thing because I'll have a little bit of anxiety mm -hmm. about it. Yeah. And so that's what, when she was having this thing, like, a, I don't know why he's not getting in the trailer. I'm being, so, no, there was just this little twinge of anxiety attached to that intention. So in the pause, how did you help her with that little twinge of anxiety? We've all felt it. I'm sure you have too. So in that pause, what did you say to her or how did you help her? Right, right. Just free that tightness in her solar plexus. Okay, so I think the biggest thing is to notice, like for her was to notice, why is it not happening? Mm -hmm. And then in that pause, did this happen? And then the fact that I put attention on it and brought it to her attention, she goes, oh my God, yes, I can feel it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to go ahead and check back in with our breathing. Okay. And we're going to think about, does this need to happen or does this not need to happen? Okay, and the more it doesn't need to happen, I mean, we weren't in a hurry, there was no fire, there was nothing that meant that that had to happen right away. And so just the thought of like, recognizing it, that there was some anxiety there, seeing what that anxiety was about, what does that anxiety really mean? Did it mean that uh, you needed to have it happen right away for some reason, or did you think he should do it faster or, you know, cause there could be a whole lot of reasons that anxiety kind of came up. And so it's like sitting there and talking through it. It's like, why do you think that anxiety was there? What, what was that? Um, and then I think it was something about, oh, it reminded me of like, there was this other thing that happened in the trailer. So she went on to describe a story of something that was not so good that happened in the trailer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then it's like, okay, so now we know what that is. So let's go ahead and let that go and breathe that out and redo it. Okay, and I think that's the point where I went and put him in the trailer. It's like, see how now this is different. This is not what it was before there's no reason to replay that you know because it's no longer applicable mm -hmm. and we can do this now in a different place but this is all minute training of perception and and awareness that a lot of everyone on here is now getting to that point where they're starting to go okay if it didn't work why and then doing the exploration internally in yourself what did I do to block that? Where is that coming from? Okay, and then, and then if I identify it, how do I get rid of it? And I think breathe, breathing is the most important part of that. That was the answer for, for me. That's what I was looking for is that you had her pause. Yeah. I, I love identify okay. what's the reason and then let's breathe. Thank you. That was wonderful. Okay. And there was just remember, there was one other part to that. It's like we create that, that draw for him, which was the fun. Yes. Then we, it's like, instead of putting that anxiety, we replace that with the fun. Okay. Yeah. So there were several parts to that. Yeah. So yeah, it's pretty, pretty cool. And I'm hoping, um, like I could do a session like this so you guys could see this in real time happening. And, you know, it's like somebody has to be kind of brave, like, you know, we were talking about, I haven't filmed a lot of this because it is intimate and it's, it, it's hard to be that vulnerable and have everyone see like, oh God, I was like, you know, really whoever, whoever ends up volunteering for that is a brave soul. And it's like, you know, we're, we're exposed ourselves to um, judgment, but I think that's, what's important in this side 
cited and what I found with people here is that they're not ugly or mean. You know, because most of us have been in these places. I've been in this place. I wouldn't be able to teach if, if I had not experienced every single thing I'm teaching and, tr you know, trying to figure this out and, and, and being vulnerable and like, oh my God, I'm just, you know, I, I'm lost and I saw this and it, it's new territory, so to speak, because I don't know, um, I don't know how many people get in this deeply with the energetic part of this. Um, I know it's kind of a new area, you know, and we're all putting our little toes in the water to see if it's too cold <laughs> or too hot out there still, you know. Um, for me, it's always been a little too hot for my taste. And I, I'm like, uh, I'm running the other way. I can be a hermit. It's all right. <laughs> and now it's, it's um, I'm realizing, wow, you know, here was my vulnerable part. Can I, can I stand up to scrutiny and can I be okay with it? And, and can I do something? And, and I think what drives us all here on this side is the fact that we want life better for not only our horses, but us. And, and we're all spreading this as much as we can. And it's, um, that's what's, that's what makes me cry every time I do this work in the, in the good way. I'm waiting for the emoji that's like the, the really good crying emoji. I don't know. There must be one, but I haven't found it. So if anybody has that one, like when we have good cries, woohoo, feel sorry for me. It's like, yay, we had this great thing. And, you know, there's nothing like a good horse story to make you cry your eyes out, I think, at least for me. I'm not anything but a horse story that has a good ending. <laughs> So, all right. Well, we got Leslie, uh, Leslie, or Lisa Marie up here in the corner. I'll go ahead and ask you to unmute. So thank you, Gail, for that lovely question. And I hope that clarified for a lot of people um, what's going on. Okay. You can ask Lisa Marie to unmute if you can. Okay. Hi, can you guys hear me? There she is. Are you there? I'm here. Oh, oh yay! You can you can put your video on if you'd like. I think we're okay. Um, uh, well, I'm driving, so there wouldn't. It. It's always nice to see the people anyway. I'm talking to. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, we won't ask you to then. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. So, do you had a question? Yeah, I wanted to ask this question last week. Um, the topic that you discussed about dominance training versus relational training, it kind of opened up my vision of what is happening with my horses. Uh, when I moved in with my husband 12 years ago, he had his two geldings. And then a few years after that, uh, we got my mare. And he's had we've had all the horses since they were babies with the exception of the oldest horse. He was 20 months when uh, he got him. And I know from listening to you and from ask, hearing people ask other questions, there's lots and lots of questions about um, releasing trauma. And I know that all of my horses have a level of trauma in them because they were I called it cowboy training. Um, so the correct term, I guess, would be considered the dominant training. And although my husband is softening, I don't believe that he is ever fully going to let go 100% of the old ways because he's 60. I think that if he would have wanted to change more of his ways with the horses, it would have already happened. Um, so with my question for our, our middle guilty, he's 16, he's a, he's a very emotional horse. Uh, forced me to the property, and then I met my husband. I really fully believe that the horse called me there. I have a bond with him that is just, I mean, you guys know, there's just no word to, to match to it. And about Six years ago, out of nowhere, being when he was tied up, he would sit back and not just 
soul on the lead rope to see if he could loosen it, but like his whole body sitting back and it's very scary. I don't want him to get hurt. And he has, he stopped doing that. Um, he hasn't done it for many years. And then he's done it twice this year. Um, the incident, the last one was the day before the last Zoom. And I just, I want him to be able to, to trust me. And there wasn't really anything that happened um, before he was tied up that we did a, a lunging session in the round pen and that went well. I'm just wondering if there's anything that I can do to help ease his mind with whatever he's got going on to cause him to sit back like that because like I said, it's scary and I don't want him to get hurt and I don't want anybody else to get hurt. So, my question. Yeah. Okay. So this is one of those that's really hard if I don't see the horse, but one of the th things that I would, what I've done, I've, I got a horse in that she actually would sit back and like, you know, it's ugly to watch that when they start fighting the rope and then sitting back and then, oh my gosh. And then it really causes damage up there um, in the C1. And um, so uh, let me think. One of the things that I, I did with the horse that um, backed up is that I would loop through the thing. So I have 22 foot rope or 20 foot, whatever it was. And I would put it through wherever I was going to tie him. So that, um, see, this is something I would have to probably do with you there. And I'm thinking how I would address it. Um, I would want the horse, actually want the horse to try to to back up. And so it's, I've got 22 feet of rope for it to start going back. So it doesn't feel like it's got to initially, like I, I'm sure they get a place where they hit that end where they know where it's like, okay, it's tied this tight. I'm going to hit it this fast. And so they're going to go further than that before they hit any resistance. And what I'm hopefully going to do is be able to go in there and um, interrupt that um, that um, when it goes into the flight or fright, because that's what's really happening. It's like something about the trigger is hitting the end of that rope and then you got to fight it. Okay. And so I would have to, if I were going to address this, see if I could create that, um, that level of tension on the rope to see if it would start to go into that mode and then interrupt that from continuing on. Because what we want to do is interrupt that, um, behavior before it goes to the place where it, it totally plays out. Okay, the whole behavior plays out because the only way you can stop a behavior like that is to interrupt it when it first starts to happen. And I don't know if there's any indication on that. And we could talk about this in a, in a session or you know, it would be good to be able to see this because every horse has been different that does that. But what I like to do is, is interrupt that process before it gets anywhere, like the very first indication. And then this is where you start using your intuition. What, there's always a trigger before that happens. There's always a trigger. And what mm -hmm. you need to do is figure out, like it may be such a subtle trigger that it's, may be imperceptible to us, but that's where you start when you're noticing your intuition. And when I was saying I was in the trailer and I could feel the anxiety, it's because I've put my attention on, I want to feel anything different than this normal place. You know, when I get to a level place and, and my energy and with the horse, then I can then notice any little glitch that starts to happen and I can address that immediately. And I think it might be the same with this horse. There might be something that he's there okay for a bit and then there's something that triggers it and he starts to go. And if you to feel that the second it starts happening and then intervene and interrupt that um, progression of the behavior that follows is what really needs to happen. Um, a lot of people try to correct it at the end where it's, the horse is sat down and then they're hitting it behind with a, uh, a whip or something like that to drive it forward again. By that time, you've already, the, 
the behavior has expressed itself fully. So you're not really gonna get a long-term change in that. So um, yeah, this is a complicated one and I'm not sure I could say how to do it in words that would make sense for you to be able to go replicate it. Um, mm -hmm. Like I said, I would have to feel. Um, and that's where, you know, when we're getting into this different relational training, it is so much about our intuition and feeling and knowing what has to happen in the moment and what just changed in that, that moment that may send the horse in a direction we don't want it to go. Okay. So I don't okay. think, at least I can really answer it sufficiently here without seeing what's what's going on and feeling what's going on okay. with my horse um it's like i never tie her i just because of that tension of i'm not going to tie you tight she never moves it's really weird like i can just loop it through the stop and it's the long rope and then if she correct that right away and say no come back up so she never feels like she has to feel trapped or in any way. It's a, and I'm right there with her. Um, you know, is that would be the only way I'd start initially, probably to solve this is to to stand by and just see if, with just your intention, like we were talking about earlier with Gail, can I be soft in the intention that you just stand and that you're okay and that everything is good. And then hopefully they back up just a little and they can get just a little feel of that. And then you're there to give them safety, comfort and take a few steps forward. We're fine. Okay. And that would be one way I might interrupt that, that behavior from progressing, but that, that's going to take a little bit of tension and time to really kind of there and play with that one. You know, a lot of people it's like, God, oh, that takes a lot of time. It does, but um, it might take a lot of time one day but it doesn't take a lot of time every single day that you tie them up. So um, I'm. we can talk again. I don't know if, did we schedule a session? I don't remember, Lisa. Um, we can talk a little bit more about that at that time and, and can I'll get some more information on that and see if I can answer okay. it better for you. Um, but yeah, this is again um, where we get into a different realm of like, well, there would be lots of things I would have done in the old days to try to fix that, but I'm not in the old days anymore. I'm in a different place and I'm in a different way of looking for long-term solution that it never happens again versus, oh boy, now I don't know when it might happen <laughs> and be excited, you know? So, um, right. Ah, that's the best I can do on that one tonight. Um, yeah, and I think somebody put, uh, Ev, uh, and I like what Ev just wrote on here. It's like uh, Warwick says what happened before. And that's essentially what I'm saying. It's like, we're paying attention to what just changed. And when you right. start being very conscious of your energy, you'll notice what just changed. Right. And for most people, it escapes them. Like nothing changed, nothing changed. Yeah, something changed. So um just noticing um, if you can find that that trigger for for the horse and um, what may send them on that place. So, all right. Okay, okay thank well, you so much. gee, we're just a little over an hour and um, thank you, Lisa, thank you so much. And um, these are such great questions. And I think as we work through time and um, we'll, we'll all support each other and do the best we can with this. And like I said, it's a new way of training. And I find it sometimes now as I'm making that trans transition to more, not just training horses, but trying to explain how I'm training horses. It, 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 you know, I worked in such silence for so long that it's like, I don't have words. How am I going to explain that? Jeez. And so it really calls on me to be very clear, just like with my neighbor who thought I was going to train every horse the same way as her other one, and it clearly didn't work. And so I, I didn't make that. I made an assumption she would know that, but why would I make that assumption? That was silly. I, in, until I explained why I wouldn't do it that way, then why would somebody not assume I would? So um, this is great. It was so much fun. And I, I think some people, it's like, I 
I was thinking, oh, I'm, I'm always so tired by the end of the day when I go to do these. And I'm like, I don't think I can do this again. And then I get energized by seeing everybody here. And I, I get excited about this work too. And I want to share things with pe people. So I think everyone a, a chance to like hear, yes, I'm a real person. Yes, I really want to uh, help everybody the best I can. And really it's my mission in life at this point in time is to share what I have learned so that information's not lost. And, you know, it was easy as an introvert to go, you know, it's okay if this information's lost. And then you see horses suffering or people having trouble and you go, no, that's not right. What can I do? And I have my big girl pants on and go out in the world and interact and guess what I live it's amazing every time I live it's it's great so um anyway I love you guys and thank you for being on the site and if anybody you can help me a lot if you can go on Amazon if you bought a book or anything or tell anybody that bought a book if you can put some reviews on there because I think that really helps with sales and right now sales are saving my life and it's so great and I, I appreciate that so until the next time which you know, I don't know what that'll be, but I will try to announce it and I'll try to make Mondays if I can. If I get too busy and I'm too far away, then I'll uh, let Leslie know and she can post an announcement. Um, but anyway, thank you guys. And we will see you again soon. And thank you for all your comments on the site. It's so exciting to have everybody there. So I appreciate it. And I will see you next time. Thank you, Susie. Bye. Bye.